Hi everybody, welcome back to another educational video from Med School EU. And today we're gonna to be jumping into a new topic called the chemical bond. And more specifically, we will discuss intramolecular bonds. So before we dive deep into the discussion of intramolecular forces, let's first take a look at the types of bonds that generally exist. And they would be placed into two separate categories. We've got the intramolecular bonds, and intermolecular bonds. So let's start with the intermolecular bonds. First, intermolecular bonds are bonds that occur between atoms, elements, or compounds. Now the key word here is going to be between, not within, because within, that's going to qualify for the intramolecular. Think of the word intra as within the compounds, whereas for uh, intermolecular bonds inter means between this one means within and inter means between now what do we mean exactly by that well if we're taking a look at a molecule of, of hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid over here well we could easily qualify that the little dots here, the red dots that are between chlorine and hydrogen, and I'm going to explain how these work in, a, in another video, but these will be qualified as intermolecular bonds. And they're not specifically bonds, they're more forces because they're not technically going to be bonds. They will be forces, that, uh, forces of attraction that occur between elements that are oppositely charged or have partial opposite charges. We're going to take a look at that in more detail later. But when we're talking about intramolecular forces, that is going to be actual bonds that exist between two elements or two atoms or within even two compounds. Now, some examples of intermolecular forces, because they ought to be mentioned here, are going to be hydrogen bonds. They will be van der Waal forces. We've got London dispersion forces, which would, would, would be tied in together with the van der Waal forces and dipole-dipole interactions. Now, if we're talking about intramolecular forces, and these ones we'll be discussing in, in this lecture specifically, are going to be metallic bonds. We'll talk about ionic bonds and polar slash nonpolar covalent bonds. So today we are specifically focusing on intramolecular forces, these ones right here, whereas these you can check out on 1.1 lecture of the biology section. And I will later on be covering this in greater detail. So the first thing to discuss are going to be ionic bonds. What are ionic bonds? Well, generally speaking, ionic bonds are going to be bonds that occur between a metal and a non-metal. And for example, we're going to take sodium and chlorine as examples of metal and non-metal. So obviously sodium is on the metal side of the periodic table and chlorine is on the non-metal side of the periodic table. One thing to mention here is that sodium is going to have 11 electrons since it's the 11th element on the periodic table. Chlorine is going to have 17 electrons since it's the 17th element on the uh, periodic table. And uh, we've got two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second, seven in the final shell, in the valence shell. And sodium would have two in the inner, uh, where we'll have eight in the second shell, and we're going to have one in the outermost shell, in the third shell. So what happens when they come cl in close proximity? Well, generally speaking, when this occurs, sodium has a great tendency to lose the electron because it wants to gain a full octet. And remember, the full octet is having eight valence electrons in that outer shell. Now, the easiest way for sodium to have eight valence electrons is not to gain seven, right? You would have to gain seven in order for that to happen. Well, that's a lot of energy to use. So instead, it's going to just lose this electron. Now, for chlorine, it's completely the opposite because it has seven electrons in its outer shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and it only needs one to fulfill the octet rather than dropping all seven. So therefore it has the greater tendency to gain that specific electron. So then these elements are gonna be very, very polarized, meaning that they're gonna be very, very attracted to each other and very readily will form a bond. Now this 
bond formation is going to be called ionic bond because the electron will be fully transferred. So another feature of ionic bonds is the electron is fully transferred to the non-metal, meaning that it will no longer be here. There's no electron anymore. This shell gets dropped. There's no more outer shell. And you have your a new valence shell that will be the second shell for sodium. Now, it won't have 11 electrons anymore. It's going to have 10 electrons. And because of that, it will form a positive charge. And chlorine now no longer has 17 electrons. It now has 18 electrons and will form a negative charge. Now you might ask, why are we forming positive charge if we're getting rid of something? It makes no sense. Well, think about it. We're getting rid of a negative charge. When you get rid of a negative, you become more positive. Now, sodium will have 11 protons in its nucleus, meaning that it has 11 positive charges and it doesn't lose a positive charge it stays there but we do lose an electron which is 10 negative charges well overall it will be plus one now chlorine will be the opposite it has 17 protons in its nucleus and then it's going to gain an electron so originally it had 17 it gains an electron it has 18 electrons so overall the charge is going to be minus one so with ionic bonds, they're going to form a formal charges on these elements. And when they form this bond, which would be ionic bond, they will now have overall, they will be neutral because the positive and the negative. However, when these are going to be split up, let's say sodium chloride is dropped in water, then they're going to form ions. Hence why it's called an ionic bond. Next, let's talk about covalent bonds. Well, covalent bonds specifically are going to happen between two or more non-metals. So for example, here I picked oxygen and two, uh, two hydrogens, which would form a water molecule. And I'm going to depict exactly how these bonds occur and what they really do. So oxygen is going to be the eighth element on the periodic table. So it's gonna have eight electrons. And hydrogen are going to have one electron each since it's the first element on the periodic table. Now what happens with these electrons is we cannot have a complete transfer because they're going to have a little bit of a tug of war between the two nonmetals because hydrogen is trying to gain an electron in order to have a full octet because it has just the first shell so it would have the full octet with two electrons. Whereas the oxygen, well, it needs two more electrons in order to fulfill its octet. So there's going to be a tug of war between these elements. And as this is happening, technically what occurs with covalent bonds is they're going to be sharing electrons. So the electrons will be present on both elements at the same time. So this way, oxygen has two on this side and hydrogen has the two. And same thing happens over here. So now oxygen, since it's sharing this particular electron and this particular electron, oxygen will now have eight electrons and hydrogen will now have two electrons each. As you can see, covalent bonds do not have full transfer of electrons. They have sharing of electrons. And this sharing of electrons does not lead particularly to uh, full charges like we saw on ionic full formal charges here. We're actually going to have partial charges. Now, since we know that oxygen is more electronegative, it, it has a greater tendency to gain an electron than hydrogen, then we know for the most part, the two electrons will reside with the oxygen in most cases. But in some cases, it will be with the hydrogen. So there, there is going to be continuous tug of war, but because the advantage is with the oxygen, it's going to have a partial negative charge. And the two hydrogens will have partial positive charges. And this will come important in knowing when we talk about the intermolecular bonds, the weak bonds, and specifically when we talk about hydrogen bonds. And finally, let's talk about metallic bonds. So metallic bonds, of course, occur between um, elements of, of metals. Uh, 
and more specifically they occur in this crystal lattice structure now with this crystal lattice what do we have going on here well these dots are going to be electrons so that's an electron that's an electron all of these are a sea of electrons as you can see here and the the sea of electrons is going to be surrounding a sea of positively charged elements and in this case that's going to be au gold so Technically speaking, metallic bonds are going to be a type of covalent bonds that will actually occur strictly between metals. And as I mentioned, it forms a sea of electrons around fixed, positively charged metal ions. Now, these, uh, these crystal lattice structures don't have to be specifically one element like Au everywhere. They could be alloys as well. So they could be pure elements like this one with, with the gold. Uh, forming a giant slab of gold, for example, where it would have just electrons flowing arbitrarily through the whole thing. It's a sea of electrons just jumping around these positively charged metal ions. Uh, however, they could also have other metals in there, for, uh, and they often would, and these metals uh, that are mixed would be called alloys. So, for example, we could have iron in there instead of, instead of uh, the... Uh, gold we would have Fe2 plus for example and some other Fe2 plus over here so this would wouldn't be a pure metal any longer it would be an alloy now let's talk a little bit about the strength of intramolecular bonds we already know that if we're comparing one to one with intermolecular bonds they're much much stronger however let's compare them to each other so we've we've talked about metallic we talked about ionic and covalent bonds. Now we did not discuss polar and nonpolar covalent because that is something I'm saving for another video when we talk about electronegativity and polarity. Uh, however, we are going to discuss it here in terms of strength of intramolecular bonds. So the highest strength of intramolecular bonds is going to be metallic bonds. Then going downwards, it's going to be ionic. Then we're going to have polar covalent and finally nonpolar covalent. So meaning that nonpolar covalent will have the lowest strength and strength would typically be measured in the amount of energy it is required to break that specific bond. So it is very, very difficult to break metallic bonds and it's a lot easier to break nonpolar covalent bonds. We're going to discuss polar versus nonpolar and electronegativity in greater detail in our next lecture. As you can see, this leads us to the end of this video and check out the next one on polarity of bonds and electronegativity.